things we're looking at Smilodon, aka Sabertooth Cat, aka Sabertooth Tiger. So uh, December will be, I decided, will be the month for mammals. And I, uh, my first subscriber, Jim uh, Connor, uh, gave me this little figure. So he requested Smilodon, here we are. So, or Sabertooth Cat, so here we are. So first and foremost, same rules apply. We have older models, newer models here. And I'll, I'll start with the actual animals themselves. Then we're gonna do the environment and the family tree. So first and foremost, this guy here is the Marks Sabertooth Cat. This is a very special one because Marks is one of the earlier companies to make these models for kids. And the idea is that um, they're like a, like a hot, hard, solid plastic. And overall, as far as the appearance goes, I'm going to kind of touch on that a little later on. But as far as the appearance goes, we're looking at the musculature of the animal. So it's a very muscular looking figure. And again, this one particularly is in a very uh, dynamic attack pose. It's you know going down, the sabers are, are showing. Uh, think of a, a sabertooth cat like a the cat equivalent to a bear. They're very big, muscular animals. You say, how do I know that? Well, you find the bones, you see uh, what's called muscle scars and attachment points, and they have really big muscles on their body, right? So they're, so they're designed to hunt really large prey. Uh, so the next model I have here, it's actually uh, 2002. This one is a Schlee, and this has this pattern here. This reminds me of the walking or prehistoric beast sabertooths that they had in South America. Uh, there are three species of Smilodon. Uh, basically, there's the, the type species of is Smilodon popular. There's Smilodon fatalis, which is more well-known, and then Smilodon gracile. So there's three species to the one genus. Now, one thing to point out here is the pattern, and I mentioned this, I mentioned this before, I think. The idea of the name Sabertooth Tiger is not quite, uh, it's a misnomer, it's not quite correct, because we doubt they actually had tiger stripes. If you don't know, if you're wondering, uh, tigers have stripes because they're living in forested areas, and the way the light goes through the leaves and branches and the, and the, and the trees, it, it, it helps them blend in better. Because you're like, how can an orange cat hide in the green and brown forest? That's how the light hits it, right? Meanwhile, if you look at something like a lion, uh, say, like an like African lion, you have this kind of like tan color like you're seeing here. Uh, you're in grasslands, that works really well. Well, the idea is the environments that two cat Smilodon lived in were not quite grasslands. They were actually like brush forested areas. So that pattern, may not, well, not quite for like a, like a, like in South, like Asia, like kind of like a brushy kind of between not grasslands, not quite dense tree forests, but like a west, like a plains. And we have in uh, the Americas, we have jaguars. And in the old world, we have leopards. And they have the spots, right? And the idea of the spot is that when the light hits it, if you are in trees, like, well, the tiger's on the ground. If these guys are in trees, the leaf pattern's there, the light hits it, it dapples it, and it kind of, they hide really well. So based on these color patterns, we can kind of say, well, where did the animal live? Well, obviously, uh, they, they suggest maybe kind of like, I, there's some suggestions of either spots or, or, or rings, not so much stripes. So, so saber-toothed tiger isn't the proper term, but cat is, you know, saber-toothed cat. And I'll tell you why we the family tree as well. But anyway, overall, this guy's really neat. Uh, they have these large sabers here and a short tail, a very important feature. Uh, this one is, like, again, it's in this kind of weird pose. It's really interesting, but it has a bit of a mane. I don't know of any research that, if you do know, put in the comments of saber tooth cats having manes. Uh, but again, uh, they're kind of, well, manes are unusual. Only lions really have them for the most part. And even then, not all lions have them. These the Sambo lions did not, you know, the males. So we have, so my, my first Sabertooth cat models were these, this guy, well this gal I should say, and it's in the cub. So the idea is that this is a safari, let's see, uh, this is a, yeah, safari 2004, the mother and cub. Uh, I like that the baby's sabers are tiny. Uh, you, they found so many Sabertooth cats that they can see the growth, pretty much, of the animal, and their sabers grew at a certain rate, basically. And so we can see that when they were babies, they had tiny sabers. They got older, they got really large, which makes total sense. Same thing with dinosaurs, the horns are smaller, the crests are not even there, and they grow as they get older, right? And so the idea is that we think that hippotooth cats are group animals. We found some that are injured, and so, and the injuries are seen in a way that they healed when the animal couldn't actually hunt. So that means it's probably either eating, you know, it's probably eating or getting food from other pack primates, I guess is the word. The difference is, he said, with well, a scavenging, which is a good question. And the idea is when you see scavenging, animals often eat not the best kind of food. And this animal should be eating healthier food, right? So these two are really great examples. In fact, I think this is my example I use on my website, the actual one, if I remember correctly. It's one of the icons I use for a website, because this is a really, really good model. Um, it's older, simple, but it has everything I'm looking for. 
uh, anti-bridge of cat other than the pattern, right? So a company called Bullyland in 2000 and doesn't tell you, Bullyland is kind of made in Germany. So this guy is, is another one of those uh, older models. It has the mane here. Bullyland is interesting because they would they would make creatures that were not really well known or at least do it in a different way than Safari Popo. Uh, but of, overall, again, I mean, there's only a few exceptions. Like none of these guys are like inaccurate. They're all pretty pretty decent, right? Um, other than the mane being a questionable thing. But overall, it's, it's what I'm looking for in a temperature cat model is that is it muscular? Is it stout? Does it have a, a short bobtail? Does the saber is reasonably sized? And the answer is yes for all these guys. Uh, this one here is actually, let's see, smell it on. Oh, Collect A, 2009. So this, this one's a really nice one too. My only concern with this one is more engineering, that the feet kind of turn in the word, so it doesn't, it stands well, but that's just, that's not a, it's not a design thing, I guess. Maybe the, you got to heat it up, but overall it has these kind of weird kind of ring-like patterns. So that's something that many paleontologists who study smell it on say that's probably the pattern, pattern similar to what they look like. So if you're looking for that kind of accuracy, you have this one. Uh, this one, my only concern is that the jaw, the gate of the jaw, is way too wide. And what I mean is, I brought my um, cat skull from work, and the idea is that the jaw, based on all the musculature studies and all that, can only open like that wide. And this model is opening like this. And that's kind of interesting, like really, really wide. And that kind of makes the bones not, they don't quite do that as well. So that's something that kind of concerns with this one model. But overall, I mean, again, not one of these is really off, except for, except for a couple, which we're going to get to. There you go. So, if you buy the Safari Tube or Prehistoric Life, it's essentially a tiny remold of this one. Uh, that's another good example. If you, want, if you have a different scaling for your models, this is a nice model too for Safari, the tubes. There's no year on this though, but um, same company, different, you know, tube spelled T-O-O-B. The tubes, you get like the, the Romans and the Egyptians and the cats and dogs and all that. Uh, so next we have I believe this is Mojo, right? So Mojo is a company that, that I've kind of more recently come across. And the year for this guy is 2010, Mojo. So what's going to say with Cat is that uh, this one, again, um, I like it a lot. Like I said, if, if you say what are your favorites, I would say these two for the way they look. And I would say this one because it's really, really like a really cool model that's really rare. Um, so this one, again, the proportions are correct. It's, and again, you can see all the muscles below the skin. And what makes this so fun with Sabertooth Cats is that with dinosaurs, we have these proper things that look like elephants sometimes. And with Sabertooth Cats, we have cats today. We can look at them and compare parts. That's really fun there. Uh, the other model I would say is one of my top tier would be this one here. This is like Papa, from, yeah, Papa 2010. So same year as this guy. Uh, this one's more lean. And I will say that there are different species of mentioned earlier, say with cat. So in some ways, I would, if I were teaching, I would separate them out like that actually. But this one again is a very good model. I mean, if you're looking for, I mean, Papo usually is like that. Um, you know, it's like the the it's kind of they kind of sell the scientific model. Whereas the Safari will tell you, oh, we're a teaching model, which is still scientific, but Papo kind of shoots for that, and they do a lot a lot of good work though. Uh, and again, this one's really nice. It has it has the savanna lion uh, pattern for the most part. But again, the short bobtail is really is really neat. So I, I mean, this is in my top three as well, actually. Uh, the next one here is another. I think it's another Papo. Yeah, 2017. So this one, uh, I like this one more. <laughs> Let's just say that. Uh, for one thing, the saber is kind of uh, spread out, which I get that they're trying to you know when kids are playing, they can bite into their prey. Uh, the, the, the mane here, it's like Scar, like a, like a jacked up Scar from, or powered up, leveled up so a Scar from Lion King. Uh, this guy, I mean the mane is something that, again, I don't see any papers suggesting this, or there's no cave art showing this, so, um, that I'm aware of. So, but it does show you one cool thing, the hand, or the front forelimb, the paw, has, it looks almost like a thumb, but it's not a thumb, it's, it is a first toe, but it's moved, for, our thumbs are poses going this way their first toe kind of comes closer. That's important for hunting. So you, most of these are on the ground, they're walking on, on, their, on their paws. This one has, you can see the paw, and I'm gonna tell you why it's important when you get to their, their prey. But overall, it's, it's still a cool model. I mean, I'm, I'm not gonna discredit it, it's a great model. It's just that it's, the main kind of throws me off. The pattern's really cool. Again, it's all speculation, so I can't tell you there. Uh, the last model is, I think, my least favorite, but it's still neat looking. It's my least favorite scientifically, but it's still neat looking, right? 
there's these, um, back in the 80s, there was a company, there was this, like, brand called Dino Riders. We had dinosaurs, and people would ride them, because fiction, story. And they essentially go to battle with them, and they had, you know, they were fighting, you know. So there's, like, a new version of that, I think, in Walmart. And they'll come with these guys, and, like, they'll come a little saddle, and a human can ride them to battle. So that's, you know, the human's not here because of reasons. But the idea is that this is a really neat example of the saber-toothed cat. The sabers do go below. So saber-toothed cats, a small amount, are often called chinless sabers because many saber-toothed cats had a, on their lower jaw, many of them had an extra bit of bone coming down here. So when the saber came down, it would protect it because saber teeth, it turns out, they scan skeletons at a stress test. They can deal with stress going forward or back, not side to side. So any shearing or sideways stress can break the sabers off. And he found some more broken sabers. So the idea is that um, uh, the fact that, that Smilodon got rid of that chin protection or did not have that, that stands out. It's really interesting. Um, but again, overall, this one has the right number of toes and stuff and uh, fingers and all that. So it's a really cool model in that sense. But overall, it's just, it's more like comic book dramatized kind of thing. So that's why I'm not as like, yay, you know. Now, that's the models, like I said, um... I, they're organized from oldest to newest. I will now organize them from, to me, accuracy. So I would say the more accurate ones are these guys here. Um, like this. this. These are more So the, the Papo, the Mojo, the Fari are more accurate. Um, anything with a mane, I'm kind of saying, like, not really. So I'll put these over here. Uh, and again, this one is, these are in the middle. <laughs> and I say this guy's with these guys, right? So that's your more more accurate figures, your less accurate figures, and at least according to my current understanding, right? Now, that being said, we're going to move on to the uh, family tree of these guys and how they fall in, right? So I will just use that one. So, say what you tiger. So in the world of cat, or, or feathered forms, uh, there, in the modern world, there are two main branches, the panthera, which include, include pan, the, the, you know, lions, Tigers, oh my, um, leopards, and jaguars, right? The felid group are mountain lions, cheetahs, bobcats, and then your house cat, basically. So these are two different major branches, and saber tooth cats are not closely related to like one of the other. Like they're, they're all, and these all share in the end a common ancestor, but they're splitting off like cousins and siblings. And so, to call it a saber tooth tiger by, 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 by nomenclature, like saying it, has, if it implies that it's closer related to tigers. And they're not. They're no closer to tigers than they are lions, leopards, and jaguars. So there's no closeness there. These guys are close to the other. They're their own group, and they're their own group here. Now, there are some, um, what are historically called false sabers. So, there, so saber teeth evolved several times in Earth's history, not only in the Gorgons and the Permian, but also there's many mammals in the, in the Cenozoic. But within the, the, the felid group, uh, you know, carnivora, bears and lions and meerkats and skunks, you know, they, they break into like the felid and the canid. And the canid side has dogs and uh, weasels and seals, right? The felid side have the cats and hyenas and mongoose and meerkats, right? Well, also, there's this group called false sabers in most old textbooks. Um, I can't say their name. It's like Neverids. They are essentially, when they first found these guys in the, in, you know, like the Eocene and, and Miocene, well, Oligocene, sorry, they thought that they were the direct ancestors of saber tooth cats that we know today, but the idea is that they were actually a different branch of an animal that had evolved cat these features. And there's actually another one too, so they're different branches. So our sabers, the Smolodon and their close relatives, are actually the, the last hurrah of our saber teeth, right? So that's kind of to understand that. Now, as far as hunting goes, one thing to point out is that when you look at most panthera, they have these long tails. And when they are running after their prey, the animal banks left, and then the, and its tail will go like that, and the animal turns, you know, like that, right? Um, like a rudder, almost. Well, the only cat today, the small amount, had a very, look at that tiny little tail. It's a teeny, teeny, tiny tail. It's a tiny, tiny tail. So what has that today on purpose? Well, bobcats. Now, bobcats can jump like 10 feet. Now, when I say 10 feet, they can't jump like vertically 10 feet. They can like launch themselves forward onto their prey. Or, you know, so that's kind of terrifying. But the idea is that they are, you know, they're, they're ambush predators. So Smolodon, we do not, despite what you see in some movies, we don't think Smolodons ran full speed and chased their prey down like cheetahs or, or lions would do. Uh, we actually think they more would kind of hide and wait. 
something would come up and they would go jump up and grab it. What is that something? I'm glad you asked. So, North America. So when you think of the Ice Age, the other effective cats, you think of who? Uh, you know, Diego, Manny, and Sid. Those are your Ice Age heroes, right? Um, or protagonists, I guess. So that is true. In North America, we had these animals here. Uh, Smilodon lives in the Americas. We do, there are saber toothed cats in other parts of the world. And Smilodon, for example, never saw the woolly rhino. It never saw Neanderthals. Um, it never saw the Irish elk, the Megaceros, because those animals are in the old world. Smilodon's a new world cat. But there were saber toothed cats in other parts of the world. And that being said, they live with mammoths. Um, but again, the woolly mammoth actually does not occur in the southern part of the United States. We pretty much see there the, the, the furthest down they go is like South Dakota uh, and below that we have Columbia Mammoth. Now Columbia Mammoth, despite their name, are not from Columbia, the country. Um, the Americas are known as Columbia because of Columbus basically. So you're at Columbia University during the revolution, right? Uh, or now. So the idea is that the, the um, well it's changed actually. So the idea is that uh, there are no Columbia Mammoth toys. Now I hypothesize the reason why is that woolly mammoths fall in ice, and we find them, and we know they ha they have they're either brunette, redhead, you know, there are no blonde mammoths I'm aware of, so we have their integument. We know they they're they're woolly, right? Um, the Columbia mammoths are found in areas like Waco and Dallas, areas that even in the Ice Age were not super cold, and we don't have an idea how hairy or not hairy they were. They are elephants. There should have been hair somewhere, but not. But how long and thick the hair was, what color it was, is lost. So I think toy makers are not happy or are not excited about making um, uh, these guys as uh, Columbia mammoth as figures. Because I have like I have like ten, I have like fifteen woolly mammoth figures, not one Columbia mammoth. Uh, anyway, so in their diet, you would see them me make well as far as the toys I have available. They ate but not eat small mammoth, uh, giant sloth, and bison. Now, one thing to point out is that. Today in the plains we have the bison, right? Uh, bison, bison, genus bison, species bison. There's an animal called bison antiquus. This is not a bison antiquus model, but I wanted to give you a rough, a little bit bigger uh, scale of here, of how we had ice age bison that lived in the, the foresty kind of areas, and then when the grasslands took over at the end of the ice age, a thousand years ago roughly, the, the planes open up and then they evolve into, or some of them evolve into the, the bison we know and love today, right? So, uh, what's going on here with the saber tooth is that it's, these are some of his main prey, but we do know living in the environment were horses. So we find horses, uh, and again, there are at least two species of horse. We have camels, and again, out of the two species of camel today, well, the two um, like true camels, uh, the dromedary, if you look at the DNA of those guys and the Ice Age camel, uh, they are very close related to each other. This, and again, these are all animals I'm showing that are not IFH figures. They're modern species, but they look like the ones we find at the same time. Uh, we have a gray wolf here, but it works as a dire wolf. Uh, and patch up to 30. We have deer, of course, living here. They look very similar to modern deer. We have things like peccaries or javelina. Uh, we have llamas living in North America as well. Uh, we also have mastodonts, which is, you know, Different than a mammoth, mastodonts eat, or sorry, mammut, proper genus. Uh, ma ma mammut eats brush, they have sharper teeth. Mammoths eat grass, they have flat teeth. And then this is a cave bear from Europe, according to the people who made it. I think it's safari, right? No, it's safari. I think it's Papo. I can't see here. Yes, yeah, Papo, 2017. Um, I'm not aware of any short, the biggest bear of all time is called the short faced bear found in the Americas. I don't have it there, they don't make them as models. So I'm going to use this as a short face bear now. And of course we have the American lion, which um, again, I've seen depicted with both uh, manes or not manes. And then of course, so these guys are North America. 2.7 million years ago, uh, Panama, well we now know it's Panama, rose out of the ocean or connected. And where South America was an island from the Jurassic on, uh, you know, it broke from Africa, you know, Pangea broke apart, and South America broke from Africa, and then it was an island. So with the dinosaurs there are very unique, right, for the most part, and then the mammals were very unique until 2.7 million years ago when Panama connects with a land bridge. So that's actually, sl giant sloths are from South America, and they migrated north. Uh, we have this thing called Macrochenia that I think never left South America. 
and we have the Armadillo Papadon and the Dicarus, these guys here, migrated north. So these are also within the prey range of Smilodon. So, but they're, but again, they're preferred, what it appears to be, their preferred prey were bison because they were big game hunters in a sense. So let me, it's getting crowded over here. Uh, so let's get that, now that you know that, let's move on. So the idea with Smilodon is that when it would hunt, it would run up, you know, it would kind of ambush it would either a bison or a baby mammoth, all right? And it would ambush, get really low, blend in, ambush a prey, and then get on his hind legs, because they have, um, they kind of slope up a little bit, They're, you know, sort of hind legs and arms. They would grab it, and like the one I showed you earlier, they have that first toe, and they would essentially grab on to the prey, and wrestle it, they would get on their hind legs, we think, and grab onto the prey, and wrestle it to the ground, right? Um, and we know that, but what we, the reason we know this, we believe we know this, is that there's a lot of back injuries on them. And of course, if you are a human or know any humans that are over like 60, many of them have back problems. Because we, for most animals, your, your, your pectoral girdle and your pelvic girdle are like this. You know, you have the pectoral pelvic, and your spine's a bridge. Humans are on the, on the bridge, so we have a lot of downward stress on our, on our vertebra, right? So the cat, you know, this high list, to grab on, that's downward pressure on this vertebra. So we see back problems, or at least back injuries in these guys. And they're, 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 they're wrestling. Um, you know, they're wrestling their prey to the ground. So once it's on the ground, how do you, how do you, you know, how do you dispatch it? Because mammals have this cool thing where we kill our food first, and then we eat it. Like so. Uh, reptiles and birds often don't do that. They will just start eating their prey <laughs> while it's alive. Um, I always use the, the example of a bug's life when hoppers is, spoiler alert. Anyway, so looking at the jaw, uh, two things. One, uh, do you know Smilodon was not the, I wouldn't say not the top predator, but it's not the biggest kid in the block. It shared its environment with the American lion. It shared its environment with the short-faced bear and with dire wolves. So there's all these large predators coming together. Uh, the king of these guys, I would say, is the bear, because bears today can chase away a pack of wolves. Um, if there were five or six, Smilodon, maybe they'll give it a chance for its money. But again, modern like grizzlies, uh, I mean omnivores, they will hunt and, well, they eat and forage, but if other animals, predators kill something, they'll just take it from them, basically. Um, so, and we know that the, and it's supposedly the American lion may have been bigger than Smilodon, too. So, that's making it like the third largest predator. And then the wolves, if there's a pack of 30, that could be an issue. You know, think of the Lion King and the hyenas. This is the American version of that. But with the skull itself, this thing here's sort of a sagittal crest. It's a ridge that the muscles from the jaw go, wait, where are they? Go through this hole and attach right here. So it opens really wide and bites really hard. Now, why is that important? Lions, when they kill their prey, modern lions in Africa, uh, they will either hold the throat and suffocate it that way, or like they'll, they'll, they'll hold it down and wrestle it. The problem with that, well, the good thing with that is that lions are the largest predators in Africa. <laughs> so if any, you know if they're holding their prey, they can spare the time to kill it and wait, for, and then and then begin to eat. Um, cheetahs, for example, when they kill their prey, they're fighting it, wrestling it. They have to eat really fast because the lions or leopards or some someone's going to steal it from them, right? So cheetahs have it really rough, more than you know. Uh, same Smilodon too. We think it can't afford to spend a lot of time killing an animal. First of all, if you're killing a bison, it's got a kick and hurt, hurt you. I mean, I never want to let you to not understand how to be a, a carnivore in the wild, every meal, almost every meal you get, you have to murder something. <laughs> you have to fight it to the ground. You have to, you know, and, and when things are dying, they tend to fight really hard, like, like really hard for their lives. So when animals do scavenge, like bears do, it makes sense because it's like, hey, I'd rather just get a dead thing than have to murder something and fight it <laughs> to the ground, you know. So anyway, uh, uh, there's so two things. First of all, there's been scans done and pressure tests. I've seen some dinosaurs too. And it turns out lions have a, modern lions have a stronger bite than Smilodon. Now, Smilodon can still bite really hard. It'd crush your skull. But the idea is that compared to a lion, lions are clamping down and holding their prey down. Smilodons aren't really doing that as much. So the thought is, how do you kill your prey quickly? And uh, there's two camps. There's one camp that says, oh, you bite it in the stomach or the rump or the throat. 
Well, one camp says the stomach, one camp says the throat. Uh, so what do you do in that situation? You get experimenting. So you take a small dot skull, you copy it, you figure out the bite force of the, based on the muscle. The, the size of the muscles compared to a leopard, cheetah, or lion that should fit in this spot. You do the calculation and go, here's the bite force, right? And then you go and you take, let's say, a dead cow, and you take a copy of the skull with bite force measurements, and you bite it in the stomach, and it bleeds a little bit, you get some skin, you bite it on the rump, uh, bleeding a little bit from skin. But again, you don't want to be in the back of these animals because kicking is really a thing. Uh, you, you know, you, as Stewie Griffin once said, you have to hate horses not to know that these animals kick if you're behind them. So if you bite the neck, the idea is that, again, the stress can be dealt with this way or that way, not lateral. So they're not biting and turning like this, that'll break their teeth off, they're biting this way. So the idea is that they're going to bite and try to sever these major arteries and things because they kill the animal very quickly. But if you want to kill your prey quick, start eating before a bear or a lion or a pack of wolves show up. So that's kind of how Smilodon kind of works, right? And I feel like I've been talking for too long because YouTube says not too long, but that's kind of like the overview of this animal. If you want to know more, via the comment section, please let me know. But the idea is that I, this is a really big topic and I don't want to talk for like three, 30 minutes or 40 minutes. But any more questions, I can do a part two of this animal. But you saw the major models that are out right now. Um, and I give you the years, and the and that was a suggestion by Jim Connor. Give the years that they were made in the company, if you can find them. Um, I'm showing you their environment. So if you want to do your own saber tooth Ice Age North America uh, setup, you can do that as well. But one more thing: how did they die out? So the question always is: how did Smilodon? Why why did it go extinct? And the answer is: why did everything else go extinct? Like. 2,000 years ago, it wasn't just a small amount that died. A lot of these large animals died off. And people want to say, I've heard people, you know, people were saying, humans show up, and then, but there's like no, that I'm aware of, early human small on fight scene, fossil site, you know. So they're together, we know, we find them contemporary, but we don't see any interactions so far, fossilized. So, uh, one way to, to explain this is that we have climate shifts, we have changes in vegetation, which are connected actually. And so if you're specialized to eat giant prey, and I just told you earlier, you live in a kind of near forested area and you're killing giant forest bison and then they all die out and replaced by, because the grasslands come along, you can't chase open plain animals. They're not, they're not gonna, you know, if you, with this tail, if the prey banks left, they're gonna just, they're not gonna catch it basically, right? So what we're seeing is that uh, it's not just small dog dying out, that the giant sloth and the woolly mammoth and Columbian mammoth and all these weird camels are dying out too. So the environment, so in general, think of it this way, the environment is, is one way, animals adapt to it, many specialize. Then there's a climate shift or a tectonic event or both, and something changes. The plants change, the coolness changes. The herbivores either die or migrate away and then new herbivores come in. And, or, you know, so, we see these changes happening and the animals are just adapting to it. And there's no point where species can't adapt anymore. Because if the prey is getting smaller and faster, Smilodon cannot kill a rabbit. It literally cannot open its mouth to kill or eat a rabbit, right? So, in a sense. So, your prey changes, you can't keep up, that's it. That's when you really specialize, you know, right? Last thing to point out about Smilodon uh, and death are the uh, La Brea tar pits, which are really pop really cool, really, really nice site where tar pits to you and I, you're like, of course, a tar pit, avoid it. But if you are a, a, a mammoth, for example, and you live in a, well, first of all, uh, we believe mammoths, like modern elephants, had matriarchs, uh, you know, moms, grandmas, aunties, and all their daughters and nieces, all that together, and the females took care of each other, and they had the wisdom. But the males, when they hit, like, puberty, are like, hey, you're too violent, get out of the herd. And so the males are by themselves a lot, so we found a lot of young males in tar pits, you know, for example, injured. And the idea is that the tar pit looks like water, you go, oh, I'm thirsty, you go on this bank, it's tar, you're stuck. Well, and then what happens then is usually um, a wolf will show up or a vulture or something, and they're like, wow, free food. And then they, and, you know, they think there's water and there's free food, and so the wolves jump, jump in, and then they get stuck. And then if your cat shows up, it's like, wow, water, food, and wolves are beat up, and they get stuck too, which is why you find, like, one or two herbivores, and, like, hundreds of wolves and, you know, thousands of wolves and hundreds of cats. So it's so what we call a predator, a predator trap, because it traps mainly predators. 
usually in warm-blooded environments or endodermic environments, where the animals are mainly warm-blooded, you'll see lots of herbivores and very few carnivores, like 10% herbivores, sorry, 10% carnivores in an area and like 90% herbivores, right? Because there's more of them eating, you know. But in the Librea tar pits, it's like, it's like inverse. So you see lots and lots of carnivores and few herbivores because you're getting trapped in this situation. And we see very few by comparison mammoths because, well, female mammoths, because they're in the herds and if, if a baby mammoth is going towards the tar, the herd will be like, hey, you can, don't do that. But a young male doesn't know any better and there's no one around to tell them any better. They get stuck sometimes, right? So, um, yeah, there's more to it than that, but I'm gonna make it, I'm gonna cut it cut it off here because I I could just keep talking for nine hours and some of you might like that and most of you according to the algorithm would not like that. If you stuck this long, thank you for tuning in. Uh, again, comment below, tell me what you like, didn't like, uh, any suggestions. But again, I've already picked out we're gonna do mammals. We're doing mammals this 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 month. Um, I'll see you next week. I might stop right. <laughs>